Hey everyone and welcome back to your Linux and open source news show. This is the first one in the new apartment and the new studio so the sound might be a bit echoey still. Don't worry, I'll fix it as soon as I can. So this week we've got Microsoft breaking a whole bunch of Linux and Windows dual boots by pushing a virtually untested update to Windows, I guess that's what happened. And also Linux distros are a bit at fault as well. We also have Google caught red-handed coercing influencers to say good things about their products if they want to keep receiving review units and no, that's not as common as you'd think. And also we've got the GNOME 47 beta and a lot of other things, including this segue to our sponsor. So this video is sponsored by Proton Mail. If you are a viewer of the channel, you know who they are. And if you're not a viewer of the channel, you also know who they are. They're your all-in-one suite that is end-to-end -end encrypted, zero access encrypted. It's focused on privacy and on security. The entire suite should have all the features that you need. And you also know that all your data stays yours because everything is encrypted and even Proton employees cannot get access to it. You can create a free account that will give you access to all of these services and the entire suite. And if you need more storage space or more features, they have paid plans, including the recently launched Proton Duo, which gives you two Proton Unlimited subscriptions for the price of one and a half. So you can subscribe your significant other or family member as well and pay less than if you bought two subscriptions individually. Check out the link in the description below to get started with Proton Mail. This is what I use to manage my own email, my own online storage space for personal important documents and I can only recommend them. All right, so you can thank Microsoft for this one as they pushed a patch that they apparently had been working on for a while, which broke dual boots on a lot of people's computers, making their Linux systems unbootable. The patch was supposed to fix a pretty severe flaw related to Grub2 that let potential attackers bypass secure boot. That's a flaw that was uncovered in 2022, but only received a patch yesterday. And in doing that patch, users who dual booted Windows and Linux and who had secure boot turned on received a nice little message along the lines of security policy violation or something went seriously wrong. The gist of the issue seems to be linked to SBAT or secure boot advanced targeting, a way to declare which version of components that are part of the secure boot chain are patched for the latest discovered vulnerabilities. And also a way to say this part is not secure anymore, it's not been patched, so yeah, secure boot, not okay right now. What Microsoft did is push a Windows update that told that secure boot chain to not trust any version of Grub under a certain level, because these versions were actually vulnerable and could be used to bypass secure boot and to compromise Windows. Now, Microsoft said that this update should not have applied to Linux and Windows dual boots, but they messed up and they did apply it to all of these systems, which is what caused the issue. But the affected Linux distros are also at fault here because they should have shipped updated versions of Grub, at least if they said they wanted to support Secure Boot and they wanted to sign those versions of Grub for Secure Boot. It seems like people running Ubuntu 24.04 or Debian 12 were affected by this issue. Microsoft didn't really respond to anyone affected yet, as far as I could see, so the best option right now is to disable the annoyance that is Secure Boot or to uninstall the latest Windows security update, although this will likely reinstall itself sooner or later. And I'm sure some people will say that Microsoft intentionally borked these dual boots because they're evil and they want to kill Linux. But the truth is, they're just probably incompetent. Virtually every major Windows 11 update broke something for one subset of users or another. It's just very easy to check. There's been an article written about every single one of these updates because there's been a major bug with every single one of them. Whether that's due to Microsoft firing their testing team a while back and never replacing them or because they're just bad at their job or because Windows is such an old legacy spaghetti code unmaintainable mess that it's impossible to do anything without breaking something else. I don't know. What's sure is now Microsoft's actions are starting to affect other systems, which is really bad. But also some Linux distros really should revamp how they sign packages for Secure Boot and update their stuff. 
Google was caught red-handed trying to coerce influencers to say good things about their latest Pixel phones if they wanted to keep receiving phones to review. These influencers would still receive any form of Pixel device if they agreed to never feature a Pixel phone alongside any competing phone, or if they agreed to never show preference for anything other than the Google Pixel. Basically, you either had to lie about your own feelings and not really have a comparative review, or you just did not have a Pixel review on the same day as other creators. And it's not an interpretation that I'm making here. It is clearly labeled in text. There was a question you had to answer to get into the program, which said, if it appears other brands are being preferred over the Pixel, we will need to seize the relationship between the brand and the creator. Google even acknowledged there's a problem here. They said their language missed the mark. And they also said that the Team Pixel program, which is the one affected, is not meant for press or tech reviewers, but for specific content creators. But that's just pure gaslighting. Everyone knows a content creator that gets a free Pixel will make a video review about it. Even if it's just an Instagrammer using the Pixel to take their next set of pictures, they will still say some things about the phone. Also, some independent reviewers and tech journalists were grouped into that Team Pixel program for their review units, compared to other influencers like AIMKBHD, who is not in that program. And if you think this is normal practice, that influencers or YouTubers or press, when they receive a review unit, they are basically muzzled, that's not the case at all. Even when I received the Steam Deck from Valve as a prototype, not even the real final version, I never even got a signed agreement on what I could talk about. Basically, no one really does that. If you only say bad things about review units from a certain company, of course, they're gonna stop sending you products. But there's never a written contract saying that if you say something bad once or you prefer something else, then you never get review units anymore. This is way out of line. And now it makes basically every pixel review completely untrustworthy because you don't know if Google has the same agreement with any other reviewer, no matter what they say. So even if the review is genuinely very positive and the phone is excellent, you cannot really trust that review anymore. So pretty bad marketing here, Google. Now, the new NVIDIA drivers are now finally available in stable form for Linux. Version 560 is the version that transitions to the open source NVIDIA modules for supported GPU, so RTX and above. All benchmarks point to the fact that these modules perform just as well as the proprietary ones on the same card. So it's just a matter of licensing for now for most users. Nothing really changes. Well, that's not entirely true. These drivers also bring a bunch of fixes, notably to freezes in the plasma shell under Wayland. They also fix some issues with DVI outputs going to HDMI monitors. Multi-monitor setups should be better supported under Wayland as well. X Wayland support received a lot of fixes as well, notably for running games. And there are plenty of quality of life improvements and added support for various things, notably enabling hardware accelerated screen sharing through Pipewire. Even if you have multiple clients, for example, you could be sharing your screen with hardware acceleration and also recording it with hardware acceleration through NVENC. Pre-Volta architecture GPUs also gained variable refresh rate support with these drivers, which is nice because these cards are starting to get pretty old these days and they're still getting updates, so that's cool. Anyway, mandatory update if you have an NVIDIA GPU on Linux. This probably will improve your Wayland experience if that's what you're looking for. And even if you have an older GPU, you still gain a few features. And don't worry, NVIDIA will automatically detect the GPU you have and select the proprietary drivers or the new open modules if your GPU supports them. Now, GNOME 47 got its beta this week, a month before the final stable version. You can expect a lot of changes this time with hardware accelerated screen recording, support for binding actions to the buttons of drawing tablets and their styluses. You've got support for pressure ranges for styluses. There's also the first steps for the color management protocol for HDR support. There's the ability to better handle secondary GPU failures. Accent colors are now a thing. And the calendar can import ICS files with drag and drop. The console now supports screen readers again. 
Microsoft 365 support in the online accounts now works pretty well. There's a new optional extension in the official GNOME extensions package that brings back the system tray. The Epiphany web browser received a lot of changes as well, like auto-filling fields in web pages, a privacy report, importing passwords from CSVs, bookmark sorting, bookmark search, and a lot more. And there are also plenty of background changes in the settings because you do need to revamp the settings with every desktop version. That's a law in the Linux world. There's also updates to the various portals. There's remote desktop support under Wayland that has been improved and plenty of bug fixes. GNOME 47 is going to be a very interesting update, much bigger than GNOME 45 or 46 ever were. And obviously you can expect a dedicated video on the channel about this specific thing. I think it's gonna release in mid-September, so you can expect the video around that time. Now, KDE published a few results from the data they collected through their voluntary user feedback slash telemetry tool. This thing was introduced with Plasma 5.18. It was always opt-in and it let users choose which level of data they wanted to share. And now we have a few conclusions. For example, Wayland adoption is a measly 45% for the ensemble of KDE users. But if you filter out KDE 5 users, then you are at about 80% Wayland use for Plasma 6. X11 users of Plasma seem to mostly rely on AMD GPUs, but Nvidia still holds a big share. Whereas on Wayland, Nvidia's share is much lower. They also noticed a while back that more people than they thought still used 800 by 600 or 640 by 480 displays, notably for virtual machines. They also used that data to make decisions when developing stuff for KDE. For example, a while back someone claimed that no one still relied on OpenGL2 and so they could make a change in their code base to drop this older version. But when they checked the data, they noticed 5% of their user base still relied on OpenGL2 and had no access to something newer, so they decided to not go through with that specific change. Ultimately though, it looks like that telemetry project didn't really work out. Apparently a lot of decisions that they had to make simply did not have the data to decide one way or another, or if they had the data, there was just way too little of it to be of any real use. At some point, they wanted to add more stuff that users could opt in to share. But the issue was, once users have set the level of data they are willing to share, you can't really sneakily add anything to what they agreed to. So you need an extra new data collection step for the users to choose, or you need to warn the user and the current implementation simply doesn't allow for that. In the end, they did gather a bunch of user feedback, but it doesn't look like this thing really serves its purpose. In most cases, it doesn't provide the data they need to actually take a decision. So they're gonna propose a revamp of that system at Academy to see how they could handle uh, managing all of this and really having some actionable stuff that they can look at. And let's finish this with the gaming news. It looks like Linux now caught up to or even surpassed Windows in terms of games performance. Jason Evangelo, who you probably know of Linux for Everyone or he worked at Thunderbird, now he's back to writing at Forbes. And he wrote a nice comparison benchmark run on the latest Framework 13 with the Ryzen 7 7840U and its integrated graphics. In his tests, Windows took a small win on Total War Warhammer 3 and Forza Horizon 5, but Linux, represented by Fedora 40, got better FPS than Microsoft's operating system in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is a native Linux game, but also in Cyberpunk 2077, which is not native and runs with Proton. And that performance gap got even bigger when you enable FSR. Now, whether it's Windows or Linux getting the better average and minimum FPS, the differences are relatively small between the two, which is an achievement in itself. And both systems managed to get decent frame rates that made the games playable, which is pretty interesting. And of course, it's only a very small subset of games and it's running them at their worst on relatively underpowered hardware for gaming. Maybe the numbers are very different when you're looking at a full-blown desktop gaming PC with a powerful CPU, a dedicated GPU. Maybe then Windows takes the cake. But it's still interesting to see that in some cases, even for games never developed for Linux at all, you're still beating Windows. I don't know why, but it's fun. And we also have an interesting update to Wine this week, version 9.16, which brings the first implementation of the Windows driver store. 
This is something from the Windows Vista era, and it basically just stores third-party drivers in a secure location. Only the drivers from that store can be installed on the system, meaning that when you attempt to install new drivers, these are checked first to see if they're validated, and then they're copied to the driver store before the install. Presumably, this should help fix a bunch of programs that need to install drivers during their setup process and make them basically work with Wine. The Wine Wayland driver also got some updates and 25 bugs were fixed overall, including for Anarchy Online, Foxit PDF Reader, PaintShop Pro X7 and more. And for once, this looks like a major change made to run programs better, not just games, but applications, which is nice because in my testing, I found that Wine really requires a lot of elbow grease to even get a install a window to display, if you even can get that. What you can get though is this message from our sponsor. It's Tuxedo Computers. They make laptops, desktops, and small form factor computers that run Linux out of the box. And they're actually designed to run Linux. The company even contributes patches upstream to make sure that these devices run Linux really well. They have a big range of computers from ultrabooks to gaming PCs, gaming laptops, towers, workstations, whatever you need. All the components can be checked and picked specifically for what you want. You can have your own logo laser etched on the lid of your laptop. You can have your own custom keyboard layout on your laptops as well. And nowadays, I only use Tuxedo computers. This entire channel is run on one of their laptops. I even do all the editing on it. And all my gaming needs are served with one of their desktop PCs. So if you need a new computer, you want to run Linux on it, you want to support a company that contributes to Linux, click the link in the description below and give a shot to Tuxedo. They're really, really good. Anyway, this will conclude the video. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. As always, you know what to do. Click the various buttons, like, subscribe, comment, whatever else. It helps with the channel. And if you really enjoy the channel, you can also support it. All the links are in the description and you'll get plenty of cool perks in the process. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.